most merciful. Before I go into the talk and go into the details of this complex name that we've chosen, in simple words, we're going to talk about change. And change in itself is the only constant in this world. So defining which aspects we're going through, we'll just focus on two. That is innovation and collaboration. There are so many other things that we will not touch upon. And this is not a, a 30, 40 minutes. We can just touch this uh, scratch at the surface of this topic. So bear with us. There will be some interactive um, options like I'll ask a question and give you 30 seconds to think about them. Then you can type your response or ideas. And that will hopefully help us collaboratively progress this webinar as well. Before I start, the first thing I want to ask, and I'll give you about 15 seconds to think about it, is when was the last time you did something for the first time? When was the last time you did something for the first time? Just think about it and write one word in the chat box. Okay, thank you. So let me take you through my background quickly. I um, have a computer science degree, Oxford Business Alumnus, very strong passion for helping organizations improve themselves, having seen so many different models, methodologies, struggling teams, enterprises, startups, all those things have taught me something that I really am passionate about and sharing other, with others. It boils down to a methodology that is very famous right now um, in the Western world. It's the Agile and Lean Transformation. I have been coaching teams of varying sizes at all levels from Fortune 6 to, to 300. And that has brought me into this mindset of continuous innovation and disciplined execution. A wide topic, we'll, we'll go through a few bits. Recently, I've helped GE, General Electric, uh, with their telecom asset management um, acquisition that they did in Cambridge. Uh, others, other organizations include Department of Work and Pensions, uh, which is the UK government. They're one of their biggest IT project ever that they, they are in progress. That is in progress. Then Standard Life is a financial institution. And uh, the last one is Xerox, which is manufacturing. So, Can uh, we just a few ch chat questions uh, pop, popped up with the option you had given. People have written, I used Facebook for the first time. Somebody said that I fixed my car. Somebody wrote I, that I went for a safari trip last month. Very good. OK. OK. That gives me an idea that yeah. we are alive. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, it just takes some time for people to start writing. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. so uh, from my uh, professional background, I have moved around in various parts of the world. I have been uh, focusing on the outsourcing and offshore team management and collaboration. And with that, I have been on both ends of this equation. I have been on the delivery end when I used to be in the South Asian region. And then I came into the UK, where I was in the uh, service requirement side. I've been through uh, various channels in the US, those companies that outsource to the South Asian region, and vice versa. So that experience helps me, and it actually has helped me see how the industry is challenged. Software being a very subjective uh, entity, it's very, very difficult to decide whether we have completed an agreed deliverable. And that makes it a really complex transaction. So having lived in different parts of the world and different regions and in different aspects of this complexity, I have this cultural intersection that, that I can appreciate and the communication issues and the collaboration issues that the team, teams go through. And ultimately, I've seen so many failing scenarios and we have learned together from them in different scenarios. So I'll be going, taking you through those in the next few minutes. 
today's agenda. Uh, do um, I've kept it very simple. It's just three sections. First, we'll focus on the collaborative nature of the team and how they work. Second one, why is it important to prioritize and what are the ways we can think about prioritization, especially from program delivery point of view. Uh, by the way, we will be focusing more on the software and IT organizations, but I see that no organization can survive without an IT department now. So it actually relates to all industries. And the last one is uh, a mindset of failing early and not focusing on something that we, we think will work and we keep spending the money. It's a sunk investment mindset. We need to uh, identify that. Okay. Uh, do uh, keep looking at the right side of the uh, right top corner of your screen where you'll see the progress of our presentation today. That will give you a clue of where we are. Now, point to ponder again, next 15 seconds. Who thinks luck and predictability have any role to play in our business life? Does anybody agree or disagree to the statement, we need to become increasingly lucky? You can type your answers in the chat box. Let me, let me help to read. Um, well, we have Mr. Dilip who said, yes, I think so. Mr. Ms. Maliha says, agree. Mr. Khalid Mahmoud says, no, I don't agree. Muhammad Salim, again, uh, predicting is important via worst case analysis. Okay, okay, these are keep on coming. Uh, that, that, that gives me an idea. So it, it's a mix. Uh, what you've told me till now, it's mostly yes, a few no's yeah. as well. Yeah. And let's explore what the statement means. Any similarities? Anybody can identify what's similar between these two people? Richard Branson on left and Albert Einstein on the right. Richard Branson. <laughs> They're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So yeah, there are a few analogies there as well. Yes. Uh, Richard Branson, the owner and the initiator, the entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. Uh, and the waiters, yeah. Owned, and the waiters, yeah. Yeah. The Virgin and Plant, Virgin Group, anything to do with Virgin Atlantic, the railway, anything. There's so many um, organizations they are running, Virgin Media as well. And Albert Einstein, uh, known for his theory of relativity and a couple of more other uh, less famous ideas. People think these guys were amazing and yes they are. But they didn't do it in one go. They've made so many mistakes in their lives. We easily forget that Richard Branson actually initiated. Can you, can you imagine for 10 seconds how many companies would have uh, Richard Branson started? A rough figure. He has about 20 successful companies that are running right now. So it definitely would be more than that. But if you imagine for a moment, he tried 400 companies, 400 plus companies to get there. That means he has had majority of failures. What does that mean? He has been learning iteratively, making sure that he learns from the mistakes, tries something new every time. If something was in the right direction, he would persevere or pivot. But if, it doesn't, if something doesn't work, he would perish that idea and move on to a new idea. Keep innovating. Same goes with Albert Einstein. He wrote more than 250 papers. Most of them didn't get him any fame. Only one finally got him to the place where he wanted to go. And now he's, he's leg a legend. Both of these guys have tried iteratively, innovatively, and ultimately they've reached here. And they haven't stopped. So, okay, Albert Einstein has passed away, but Richard Benson hasn't stopped yet. You never know, tomorrow he might be launching another new adventure. So the mindset that we need to go to is, we need to try, we need to keep trying. The business landscape right now in this economic crisis, is all these economic challenges, global uh, 
meltdown. This is a if you consider this uh, consider this as a game of chess. It's a yes, it is a game of chess, but it has evolving pieces, continuously added dimensions, so many players being added. If we think chess is played between two people, go ahead and Google it, and you'll find out there are so many models of chess that have been launched that have more than two players, many more pieces, other dimensions added. So we should not box our thoughts into a traditional mindset. We need to think innovatively, out of the box. We need to challenge our own limits that we have set or the industry has set on us. For example, Nokia used to be 98% owner of the mobile market. Who would have thought in Nokia five years ago, their strategist, that Apple, Apple's biggest competitor right now would be Google. It's beyond imagination. Nokia owned the market and now they're not even, they're actually third right now and struggling. And you imagine, same organization moved from where to here and they used to rule the market more than a decade, for more than a decade. What we learned from Thomas Edison, the, the founder, the, the GE guy, said all we need to do is keep trying and finding the ways that don't work. And as long as we know which ways don't work, we will continuously make new mistakes and learn from those new mistakes. And that is that should be the philosophy of life. Why should you we keep trying trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? That is insanity according to Einstein. Okay, let's take another example of Wikipedia. So famous. Amazing concept. It's a free encyclopedia. And anybody can contribute. Do you think that was produced in one go? That same person actually started Newpedia, which nobody knows about. He tried, he got the passionate people, tried a few things, iteratively, collaboratively, he found some mistakes in his previous venture, dropped that idea, started Wikipedia, and it flew off. And you see where it is right now. Any information we need, go to Google, search for it. We, it's Wikipedia is the source to go to. Now it's time for the first activity. Keep those thoughts in mind about innovation and the iterative nature of the needs for this existence in business scenario right now. I'll give you about 30 seconds to have a read through, about 45 seconds actually, it's quite a lot. In the next 45 seconds go through this and type two words in the chat box about how you would prevent such a problem. Go through the slide, think about two words. In two words you can suggest how would you solve this problem. Are we? Yep. Uh, while Moniari wrote PGM methodology and methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Khalid Mahmoud wrote collaboration for meeting customers' expectation. Very good. Um, Mr. Abrar Ahmed wrote, never assume. Mr. Ansari wrote, okay. better yeah. communication, Mr. Mm -hmm. Dalib said, by effective communication and retrading and what we have understood. 
Okay, that's fine. That's but it gives gives us an idea, and based on all these um, one-liners, I would say, or two words, if, if you look at it closely, this redefines. Or actually, this is the real-world scenario of different departments, different aspects of service delivery or product de delivery, and they are trying to work together and deliver something be it the design team, delivery team, sales team, documentation team, whoever. And we have ourselves boxed our thoughts into this role-based organization where people think they are part of the development team, oh, okay. So it's us developers and them business. It's us developers and those testers. That mindset has hurt the business so badly that 90% of the pro uh, projects in waterfall model, they fail. I'll go through, through the waterfall model in a while and I'll compare the methodology that I'm talking about in the third section of this uh, presentation. But uh, bear with me for that if you don't know what a waterfall is. the difference between a waterfall model and an iterative model. I would just keep in mind that maybe what we are talking about is reducing the silos. The silos cause communication gaps and communication gaps are uh, they ultimately result in loss of business. Okay, So we've completed the first section and the key thing to remember from, from here is keep trying collaboratively. We need to make new mistakes and collaboration is a critical need for us to move forward. Okay, okay let's go to the next phase. Now according to standards and poor standard board 500 rating, any organization that comes into this rating, they used to stay here for about 25 to 35 years. So standard poor's could predict the viability of an organization so well that they knew if anybody would make it, they'll stay there. And that is a long time, 25 to 35 years is a long time. Things have changed. The world has become fast. We need to try harder, faster. So the near the new average lifespan has been reduced to 10 to 15 years. That's less than half the original lifespan. You imagine the difference. And this has been over within the last decade. Things have changed. We need to change ourselves as well. What used to work 10 years ago does not work anymore. It might have been best practice at that time. We need to rethink how we develop, how we deliver, how we engage the teams within the departments and outside the organization as well. The crux of the matter is there is no predictable path to success. If there is, we, we don't know what that is. And that is a quest. We need to work together to find something that can be more predictable, not what is surely predictable. If we knew exactly where we, where we want to go from a software organization point of view, we would always be wrong because things would change. And if it's known, that means your competition might already be ahead of you. So we need to be very careful in innovating as well. We can't take too long to build the product of the highest quality and nobody wants it because your competitor has already taken the market. There is a um, famous author called Mike Cohen, one of the very f key contributors to Agile and Lean, actually Agile environment. Um, he came up with this idea of a planning onion. The current methodology promotes a one-off plan at the start of the year. You go through a high-level vision, map it into a product roadmap. These business guys hardly ever talk to the delivery teams on what they think is viable. Sometimes these guys have less visibility of what is possible and what is not from their own architecture point of view. When business wants something to be done, they decide, they budget, they give that budget to IT or if we call the existing model um, collaborative, they would, uh, they would give them very high level requirements of a direction and the business IT, IT team would give their estimates. What is an estimate? Estimate most probably 
is wrong because it does not cater for the market change. If you are going to incorporate market change in an estimate, it will be an infinite amount of money you would ask for. Because how can we predict th how things would work? What I want today might not be of any use to me in the next six months, after six months. Sorry. So even if the what business needs or wants, if the IT delivers that, let's say in one year, the business might still say, oh, the project has failed. Why? Because the market has changed. What we wanted one year ago is not good enough. We need something else. And when they ask the, uh, the delivery team to change, they say, oh, our original estimates need to go further. So it becomes, from one year, it becomes one and a half year project. And that's a never ending story. As I mentioned earlier, 90% of existing traditional methodology projects do not meet their original estimates. Okay. So that brings a question. And it's a very common misconception. People think Agile doesn't allow for long term planning. It does. It gives the, it builds that flexi flexibility into the estimates. We can budget. There are ways. We have tried, tested, proven, and benefited from all of those methods. All we need to do is a little bit, uh, be a little bit more innovative from team collaboration point of view. And we'll go through a little bit on that in a few minutes. Okay, time comes for the second activity. In the next 45 seconds, can you please type what do you think this is? And I'm not just a, I know this is a traffic jam, <laughs> but can you um, create an analogy in your mind? Just think about it. What comes to your mind when you see such a um, situation? Okay. okay. Uh, receiving how much selling China. China. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Somebody wrote lack of control planning. S somebody wrote discipline followers. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> somebody wrote commute is a part of life. <laughs> <laughs> Poor traffic management need to think for alternative solutions. Somebody wrote, owning a car for better lifestyle is wrong. We got the idea. Yeah. This is yeah. a, a, one of the very famous traffic jams. I think one of the longest ever in the world was in China. Yeah. Uh, without going into that detail, the idea behind this concept is if we start too many programs that does not guarantee completion of too many programs and success of all those programs if we allow too many cars in the motorway and we can see there is a bottleneck somewhere which is causing all this the Okay, it, it might appear to be a good use of the bandwidth of the resources. Almost every inch of drivable area of that motorway is being used. From one aspect, oh yes, we are utilizing the motorway very well. But from flow point of view, we are wasting our time. Why? Because there is an optimal way to utilize resources. If we start too many programs and allocate too many teams, too many resources, and think that we can start too many programs and get to the completion and produce something useful, ultimately we'll come to a halt because the monitoring and control and the direction will be lost, especially if there are longer programs. And the idea here is if you allow too many cars, it will become a parking lot. Control the input 
manage the traffic, change the speed limits at various areas, and control the flow so that lesser resources are used at one time, and the flow continues. This happens in shorter cycles, and smaller group of a small group of cars in a motorway or smaller teams in the progress of a program. Uh, another analogy would be when we use our PC, if anybody remembers using Windows, you press Control or Delete, and you, so PC has almost stopped responding. You press Control or Delete, see the processor usage. You'll see 90% processor using. Or you say, okay, yeah, my processor is very strong and it's being 90% utilized. Do you see any progress in your PC? No, we, will, we would become surprised. The normal usage of the processor should be less than 10%. And that allows the optimal usage of those resources for our processing. We accept that, but in the programs we forget about it. We start too many programs, we, and that forces us to stay in this sunk investment mindset because we can't change. We have committed our resources. We have committed yearly budgets. When we commit a yearly budget and that is inflexible, ultimately we're going to struggle because if market conditions change for more than half of the programs, we are stuck. We are going to spend all that money and we know we are going to fail. I, th that is a, we're going to hit the wall one day. And that is a definition of insanity for me as well. You know you're going to fail, but you're spending it because you committed to spend it. There should be a mechanism to control it. And that is given by Agile and Lean Transformation. That is how we go and help organizations, help them think in those ways. Instead of making this a parking lot, control your input. And that means we need to prioritize. So the second part of this presentation completes with this one, the second message, manage changing priorities. If the, we have prioritized our program portfolio, yes, we can commit to the next year. However, we'll review it every three months. That's iterative and collaboratively, we'll see where we are after three months and we'll choose which programs to stop and which programs to initiate, which programs to continue. So it's either persevere, pivot, or perish. We need to choose the right programs and we need to keep choosing the right programs. Iteratively. Okay. Um, as promised in the earlier part of the presentation, the, the waterfall model, for those who are not familiar with this, the lower steps, you can see it's a waterfall. Ignore the headings on the top for the first the part. Requirements, design, implementation, and integration. It's a standard waterfall model. We define the requirements up front. Business wants the IT to tell them how much it would cost to produce these 10 features, let's say. Design team is sometimes involved. The project manager comes back with the estimate. Business says, okay, you asked me for 1 million. I'll give you half a million, but you still need to do it within a specific time. So it's the, the golden triangle issue. What happens during the life cycle is, we decide the planned ship date for all those agreed requirements. The problem comes in when we go near the system integration time and the delivery time. Things start going wrong. What started as a green, 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 green project and in the middle or near the end it became amber and ultimately it becomes red. That's a traditional waterfall model. You start good. You feel good in the initial part of the program. Near the end, you start seeing problems. Suddenly, it becomes a can of worms, and the team ultimately ex is gets exhausted. Both both sides, business and IT, and there's an inherent mistrust between the two of them. The way if we continue working like the waterfall model, it's bound to fail because we are not allowing that business change, the economic crisis, or anything that can come in any time. The Agile and Lean methodology allows that, allows that to be incorporated into the model. And I'll show you in a few minutes how that works. But if you look at the top headings, there is a lot of enthusiasm in the start. There is a false sense of security in the middle of the program, from start to the middle. And near the end, there is a rude awakening that, oh, we can't deliver. We need to reset our expectations, and then we might be able to get what we really want. 
And that's that big delay, the last part, the rude awakening, the resetting expectation, and the last bit, they relate to the end of most of the products. This is what I call failure. Ninety percent of the projects fail. I call this failure. Why? Because you knew you were not going to make it because you were not so doing this incrementally. You wanted the whole building to be completed in one go. You were not building the foundation. You were not thinking about the bigger architecture. You're just trying to build the full building in one go and just assume that you're pulling a, a pole, uh, a light pole, and you you have it ready and you pull it to stand it up, erect it, and then assume that yeah everything went fine. No, this doesn't happen in software. In in build solutions delivery. So what we do? We recently helped um, a Fortune six organization who was struggling with their product portfolio. They wanted to prioritize. Their biggest problem was whenever they prioritized, come came up with a list, allocated the budget. Halfway down the line, within that fiscal year, they would start struggling and realizing that what they chose to do was sometimes, let's say, 50% correct. The estimates were 30% uh, within the range. But near the end, let's say the last quarter, they realized, no, we can't deliver the key projects or programs because of the market changed. As this change progresses, we realize, oh, the programs that we decided not to do, they are critical. But the portfolio team doesn't have any option. The waterfall model doesn't allow that to happen because the control is with the operations team. The program team is stuck with that. They have committed to a budget. They have decided to do some things and that is being monitored and reported and controlled. However, with the change in the market state, they want to change, but they are not allowed to, because that will impact the overall reporting mechanism, and there's a lot of overhead around it. So the, the actual progress of any program might not be beneficial by the end of the year. So we need to choose very carefully. I'll clarify this point a little bit further. It's, it's, it takes a little bit of time to think about how it would work. Think of, about it as a iteration, a cycle. We do these things in cycles. We commit to the budget in cycles. Okay, there is a rough budget in our mind, but every three months we meet up and we not only discuss the budget, we discuss and see a demonstrable increment of the programs in the live mode. We are not fe delivering features in an incomplete fashion. We are actually completing the features, showing that so the delivery team shows a working increment to the business every month or every two weeks. And that allows the true progress to be seen. And that is the true reporting. You Naveed, uh, we lost you somehow. Uh, folks, I think Mr. Naveed got perhaps a disconnect. So let me see, find out. I apologize for this inconvenience, but I'm sure he'll be logging back. So please bear with us for a few seconds. Thank you.
Uh, you're back? Yes, sorry. Yeah, we had a disconnect, so Reed, I think you can continue now. Continue? Okay. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so uh, apologies for we just lost two minutes. Okay. Uh, so releases are broken down from programs and iterations are broken down from releases. How that works is we iteratively meet up, we discuss, we see the working, the demonstration, we call them show and tells or the demos at each level of the product ownership from the delivery team to their product owners, to their product line leaders, to the portfolio program managers, to the directors, to the CIOs. The, the flexibility and the beauty of this system is anybody can walk into a demo anytime and every two weeks we it's an imperative to have a demo and when that demo is a working increment it's a very simple yet fully functional increment now let's see how it's different from a waterfall model the way we did it recently and we had very um, good response and success out of this model was we started in a large organization, there are so many programs to talk about. The portfolios are sometimes contradicting. Even within portfolios, there are programs that have duplication inherent in them. The larger organizations struggle with duplication of work sometimes. Why? Because some programs have an overlap. They develop a feature, a hidden feature, in one vertical and in another vertical they find out that the there is an overlap and the same feature was developed by two programs simultaneously in parallel and one was implemented in one way and another way maintenance it becomes a complete nightmare so there needs to be an intervertical engagement and I'll show you what that is in a minute then there is a visibility of the backlog sometimes well most of the time the delivery teams do not have any visibility of what they have in their portfolio. They are just given a program or a project within a program and they are asked to do it and nobody is allowed to raise the, their heads above a certain level. The third bit, the synergy of business and technology. Most of the times business is not happy and they are very skeptical about IT because IT never delivers on time. That's a common uh, lament. Vice versa, the delivery team says we do not trust business and we don't like like them because they are setting unrealistic expectations. The system addresses that problem as well. The collaboration in a waterfall model, there is less collaboration at any given stage. The customer value alignment, only business ever talks to the customer. It's a big, big problem. The, the delivery team hardly ever hears about the customer, the real customer. And that gap creates so much problem later on. Then there is intra-vertical engagement. Within a smaller program, a smaller group of people, we, people struggle. And that demands an iterative and reconciled backlog. So without going into much more detail, all we, we do all of these things in our Agile and Lean methodology iteratively and help the business and IT come together have a collaborative progress review and it's not just a theoretical reporting review or paper based review it's actually a working increment based demo discussion and it could be that what, what the business wanted to see or deliver what, what the business wanted the IT to deliver they might the, uh, the delivery team might have done exactly what they wanted but business might want to change their mind, still might want to change their mind and this system allows that flexibility because what I think I need, what I think I want is sometimes the not aligned with what I need and that happens with business and IT most of the time. Okay, So it's a three-step process, one inter-vertical orientation, we get all the key members in, including the delivery team the product owners, the product line leaders, the, the directors in one room and the business side presents the high level portfolio vision or the direction 
to the rest of the team. It could be in a huge hall, let's say 200 people, and they have this collaborative kind of discussion, not sitting in the chairs and one person presenting. They sit in groups and business explains what the portfolio is and they go through what they think is the vision of this product, not in any level of further level of detail. Once that happens, teams go into their own verticals and I've drawn this plus sign in the middle so to show you that it's a, now they are in working in silos. They are working in their own areas. For example, utilities team would go in a separate area in their own discussion area. The telecom team might go in another one and the energy office might go in another one. And all those people will actually develop their own backlog of the program, break it down, discuss the dependencies, raise the questions and do that in their own teams. They even relatively size those programs or parts of the programs as well. We did that recently, very, very well received by the team. That was the first time that team tried it. They grouped those programs into those different sizes like small, medium, large, extra large. And this is relative sizing, so it's very easy and very, very quick. So within, let's say, a morning, they went through about 15 programs. It's very quick and it's very collaborative and so much knowledge in the team. There were team members who have been with the organization for 30 years. You can't replace that. You need that information in the room. Nobody else would know more. If we allow that platform to progress and work together collaboratively, it really works. Okay, then they, in the step three, they collaboratively, they come back. Those intra-vertical teams come back in the same group, again, about, let's say, 200 people in one room. And now they are discussing the dependencies, the questions they raised within their verticals. And they come back and they formalize, they help the business team formalize their portfolio. This is just one of the ways of iteratively, incrementally, and collaboratively defining a portfolio. We have been through the development process, now we've gone through the portfolio definition process and reprioritization process. So the idea behind this one, the third thing is we want to fail early. We need to manage the risk. But what I mean by that is if we knew what we are supposed to do, it would be very easy. But most of the businesses don't know. We don't know. Things change so quickly. So there has to be an inherent mechanism to allow trying from the first point. We need to try. We need to incrementally progress. We need to keep trying. The second one was to prioritize. If we prioritize well, to try something useful, we might fail quickly. And this mechanism, Agile and Lean Transformation, it, it allows you to fail early and do not make that wrong decision of sunk investment mindset, where people think they have committed the money to be paid for a program, let's say 12 month duration, they do not have to waste that money. Within, let's say within the first three months, they realize it's of no use. Let's stop it. And the collaboration will allow that to happen. And there are mechanisms that can be placed in. One of the ways is you bring that scrum methodology or, or any other methodology within the iterative and incremental mindset. And this Agile and Dean actually helps you keep reevaluating and do that together. So the three key topics that we've covered now, that was the crux of the discussion. And what we went through today were only three aspects of uh, the overall change we wanted to talk about. Bringing it all together, the key services that we provide and we help the organizations with are innovation, productivity, and motivation. And what we discussed today was we keep trying collaboratively so that was an aspect of motivation because you involve the teams, you bring them into decision maker, a room where the decision makers are, you bring them closer and you'll see better decisions being made. And we'll, you'll see happier teams. They will feel valuable. The, the biggest challenge in the corporate world right now, delivery teams feel that they are not valuable. They are just treated as cogs and ultimately they lose motivation. And losing, losing motivation results in lack of innovation. 
and without innovation we cannot survive in this very fast paced world. So the second point is innovation and we need to make sure that we managed, manage our changing priorities. Innovation is a critical need, it's a survival tactic, it's not a luxury anymore. And finally the productivity. If we are motivated and innovative, sometimes we lose our productivity. So the methodology has to support the productivity as well. And that are the three, three key things that we help organizations to, to progress with. Answer to the initial, initial question, innovation and collaboration make us increasingly lucky. We have to get increasingly lucky, not by chance, but by trying, trying new things and learning from our mistakes. We just covered three aspects out of so many that we, uh, we help organizations with. Uh, we can go through this uh, later on whenever you um, you'll get the slide back later on. Uh, I'll even send them to you. The, the way we engage with organizations is we never give you a silver bullet. We do not believe that the silver bullet exists to solve all your problems. There is no methodology that will solve all your problems. So we come in, we assess you, we observe, we take notes and we, we spend the time with you at multiple levels and then define a target, a strategy, and instead of just training and going away, we actually coach you. We just tell, don't tell you the, the theoretical side of things. We take you through that journey of applying that methodology in your day-to-day -day work, in your own context, according to your tailored needs. We have the coaches. They go in. They implement the methodology with you because you are the best judge on whether something would work or not. We can define so many theoretical methods, but ultimately you are going to make it work. So we help that delegation to work and ultimately you are empowered to progress. Uh, my re recent book, I created this GCC edition. Uh, it was all to do with difference between practices and principles. There are so many organizations who try Agile and Lean and they sometimes fail as well. Why? Because they focus on practices too much. They try to find a book, a solution that will give them answers to all their questions. No, there is no silver bullet. So my book focuses on that, helps you realize what the industry is struggling with and how we can make it work. For my contact details, uh, send me an email. I'll send you some case studies if you're interested or for any vertical you want. And the email address is info at morphilibrium.com. Uh, if you have a Facebook page, you can go to that as well. and follow us. We have share some useful information regularly. Uh, join us on LinkedIn as well. I'll share the slides on SlideShare as well, which will help you uh, keep them handy. And the last, we conclude with this. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Think about it in your organization, whether what you did was for the first time and did you learn something? when you tried something similar in the past. So I'll hand it over to Ali and look for your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Khoja. Uh, folks, uh, uh, the question posted on the slide which you're seeing right now, feel free to share your thoughts. And uh, equally, if you have any questions that you would like to ask to Mr. Naveed Khoja, please raise your hand uh, and I'll be able to give you a chance to speak to him or you could put your questions in the question box, chat box and uh, I will read them over on your behalf. Uh, just to keep the conversation going, there are questions already posted so let me read it for you, uh, uh, Brother Naveed. Um, okay. There's a question uh, is, is it a reality to assume that organizations life cycle is on a constant reduction trend whether innovate or not? Reduction trend. Okay, if I understand the question correctly. There are books and books on this topic written on optimization and I think the industry has taken the word optimization too far. You talk about lean manufacturing and all those manufacturing concepts that came from Toyota and the reduction of waste and all those things. That actually uh, had a negative impact on the other industries as well. The amazing ideas, unless they are thought through well, 
people think reducing the task force or reducing the the delivery teams is a saving it has to be an investment mindset if we are if we need more ideas we need more people to work together Reduce and the op, the objective of this methodology, the agile and lean methodology. That's why I'm always focusing on agile and lean, not just lean and not just agile, because they have their own inherent problems. So if we combine those, that ensures there will be no layoffs. You do not need to reduce your team. You can utilize them for their own passions, and that passion can only be understood when we collaborate. So organizational for yes, according to your statement. Unfortunately, the organizations have gone into that mode, some of them, and they will struggle later on. Because unless you use your teams according to their passions, they're bound to become less motivated, less motivation leads to less innovation, and ultimately the productivity drops as well. And with less productive people, the organizations have to let them go. It's a two-way thing. Unless we are careful, we will struggle. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, another question. If too many mistakes ought to be considered healthy, then how do you induce the culture of learn from mistakes in an organization? Okay, so in the, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, again, the way we do it, uh, so traditionally, I'll, I'll show you how it doesn't work. In a traditional environment, in a waterfall program, end of the program, you'll have a end of project lessons learned meeting, or a, you'll actually not even a meeting, you'll create a report. It's called end of project report, or lessons learned report. I have never seen it being used before starting the next, pro next program. It is just a tick box exercise. You talk about existing methodologies, they all say, oh yes, there should be a project starting, document and the project initiation or, and then project closure document and within the project closure there is a requirement to tick a box saying yes we have done the lessons learned. Yes, yes you have documented the lessons learned but you are not learning from them unless you are discussing it with the team, you are using them before starting another program. And the way we do it in Agile and Lean, it is a concept called retrospectives and we don't wait for the program to finish, it is every two weeks. Iteratively, the team gets together, they dedicate about an hour, they talk about what went well in the last two weeks, what didn't go well in the last two weeks, and any suggestions. So if we are just criticizing what didn't go well, that's not useful or healthy anyway. So the mindset is what didn't go well, and what are the suggestions for the things that didn't go well. And we have, let's say we get about 10 ideas of what didn't go well and what are the suggestions. The team themselves choose, and with our facilitation initially, the team understands the value of that. The top three issues that the team thinks is are what they can do and they will discuss. They try to implement those improvements in the next two weeks, and they meet again. So it's an iterative model. You meet, you discuss, collaboratively agree on what the three critical problems are, Try to address them. If they don't work, they try again, but in a different way. And now that because the team is involved, it's not that, oh, yes, I committed to do it and I won't. Oh, I forgot I was busy. No, you're never busy. You have to allocate that time. If you're allocating your 100% to the project, this is wrong. That's just like standing on a motorway. You allow too many cars. You're giving away 100% of your time. You will not progress. You, human beings need that gap, that time to think, reflect, and learn, and move on. Unfortunately, the optimization, if you want to use your resources more than, let's say, 60%, there's a problem. There's a recent concept of, everybody might be familiar with that, G20. Google gives 20% of the time every week to their teams to do whatever they want. And that is the incubator for innovation. They're using less capacity, but they're getting the benefits as well. So. Retrospective is the way to do it, and there are so many ways to do retrospectives as well. I hope that answers the question. Okay, um, uh, another interesting one from uh, Mr. Dilip Kapola. Uh, does 
culture play a role in making innovation successful? Does innovation vary from country to country based on the culture? Uh, yeah, simple answer, definitely yes. Very strong yes on this one. Culture is the... Uh, if, if you consider the nation as an engine, culture is the engine oil. If the culture gets dirty, we need to somehow process it and improve it. Otherwise, the whole system would collapse. In an organization, if there is a negative blame culture, and that is one of our stance, we actually focus on culture quite a lot. There are so many things that, that are not written anywhere in the process, and they are part of an organization, and all to do with cultural artifacts, be it a visible interaction kind of mechanism, what happens in the kitchen. It's completely different all over the world. I've been through that scenario. I've helped so many organizations. Even within a country, there is a difference. So it has to be handled on a case-by-case case case basis. However, the values are still the same, very, very similar values, as long as we are honest, integral, and respectful. And instead of blaming, we start taking responsibility and think of ourselves as a complex system where changing one variable impacts so many other things. And doing something positive has a positive impact, and ultimately, we will get a positive response for our positive actions. That culture is unanimously applicable to all regions and all organizations. It's easier to say, but difficult to implement. For example, in the US, very open culture, very innovative discussions. Where you won't mind your boss, you challenging your boss. And whereas in the South Asian region, you cannot challenge your boss. It's a norm, it's a culture kind of thing. If you challenge your boss in the US, it's normal. Nobody would care. It's just part of their culture. In the South Asia, you do it and you might be out of the door next day. So there are ways and methods that need to be incorporated and that, that is a cultural sensitivity has to be built into the process. And actually, Asia and Lean, because of its collaborative nature, brings that inward, this, all this, uh, the closeness, um, the openness of the personalities and the closeness of the interactions. It helps people develop their skills as well. Yeah. Next one. Okay. Uh, and yeah, another one on agile. Uh, choosing and reviewing the right programs every quarter, four months. Isn't it a short time in agile change environment? Three months. <laughs> so okay. So if I understand the question correctly, uh, is three months? A very short time, it's saying? Yeah, I think the question is, isn't it a short time okay. in the change environment, I mean, to review things so quickly? Okay, I think it's a long time, actually. <laughs> the way things are changing, uh, it should be less than that. Well, but to, for any sizable, demonstrable increment to be developed and to be demonstrated to the teams, it's three months is a reasonable time to have a product review, an increment review for the teams to get together, especially for the higher level teams. They, they might not be able to make it. For example, a CIO might not want to attend all the iteration demos every two weeks. They don't have the time, but nobody would stop them. One. So if they want to walk into any of the demos, it's an open door demo. Anybody can walk in, any part of the organization. And every, let's say, three sprints, which would be one and a half months, there could be a bigger demonstration for higher management, but still an open door one. And then you can have every three months, you'll have an even bigger one, which there could be a mandate. So we actually made it mandatory for the senior management to be there at least every three months. They had to be part of the demo. They had to attend. And there, there is a huge resistance in that. You try to implement that and you see the resistance in the business side. They say, no, we don't have time to see this. We say, if you're not willing to see what we are doing, we might be not, not be going in the direction that you want us to go to. Our paper-based reporting will not help you see where we are going. So the working increment, when they see it regularly, three months is a reasonable time, but depends on the size of the program. 
if it's a one year project definitely three months is uh, appropriate if it's a six month project I would say have a review every one and a half months six weeks it's it's a subjective answer to your question it depends on the size of the program and the more collaboration the better especially at multiple levels okay, okay uh, I see so, some questions um, uh, are raised uh, specific to their uh, organization needs and requirements I think for those maybe uh, you could write directly to Mr. Khwaja on the contact addresses given uh, let me take another one and then we'll conclude uh, I think it's a supplementary question on the culture we uh, already spoke about the question is lately there have also been talks about the culture of slow especially companies like Volvo which practices it vigorously in their organizations that is take one idea spend a lot of time do not rush and focus only on its optimization what are your views on it okay um, that's a very specific and manufacturing based uh, question from the IT industry point of view or of the wider relationship between business and IT I call this in my book especially as a perfection limit and the perfection limit goes like this if you want if you wait until you do everything for everybody instead of doing something for somebody you will end up not doing anything for anybody and that perfection limit has hurt the industry quite a lot in the past okay they Volvo used to be the safest car on earth now if that was the safest car it was very heavy as well there are fuel efficiencies fuel implications in place all those things is Volvo number one in the world right now no who was more innovative Renault came back and they passed all the criteria that Volvo was already passing with lesser fuel consumption now, Renault is still not market leader Toyota Honda and to it as in this Lexus they have taken over the market how because of their innovative continuously innovation innovative and collaborative development models now the, the concept that was given by uh, the I'm forgetting the name now but the the for the concept for Tim Wood was do things well measure them try them again try to optimize them and try to optimize the overall big picture that is all well understood in the manufacturing industry the, the problem with the IT industry is you cannot define a tangible output of a software for example when you're building a part you're manufacturing a part of a car it's a tangible output when it's produced, yes, there would be variations, there, it's fine, but you have a very ballpark figure of what perfect, what good looks like. In software, it's so subjective that one statement can mean so many different things that you have to see it working to agree or disagree that this is the right thing. And I, I use this quite a lot. If we don't know where we are going, any road will take you there. And that is directly applicable to software because of the tangible uh, intangible nature of the deliverables any road could be right according to the context and the understanding of the teams so my answer to your question for Volvo there is a fine balance between quality and time to market if we focus too much on quality we might lose that window of time to market so we have to be very careful in that okay thank you all right. Uh, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Navid Khwaja, for your time and, and the valuable information that you have shared with our participants. Uh, uh, thank you indeed. Uh, it was very, very engaging and intriguing. Uh, and folks, all of you who have attended the webinar, once again, thank you very much for attending. We are recording this webinar and shall be uploading it on our YouTube channel uh, and the blog. Uh, I will be sharing the link with you all uh, in a couple of days. Once again, Mr. Khwaja, thank you very much for your time. Once again, Mr. Khwaja, thank you.